When we zoom out from the property scale to the neighborhood scale, impervious surface area becomes much greater. Dense road networks, parking lots, and commercial and residential subdivisions present different stormwater management issues. These impervious features generate large amounts of runoff and high levels of pollution from vehicles, including hydrocarbons and metals. Runoff also contains sediments from construction sites and other activities. The increased runoff and contaminants pose challenges for stormwater management at the neighborhood scale. There are several innovative designs that can be applied at this scale in order to reduce the amount of water, delay the timing of runoff, and improve the quality of runoff. This video will cover three areas, parking lot designs, road designs, and detention ponds and wetlands. Parking lot designs. Most developers are required by municipalities to provide parking for customers and employees on site. However, pollution that is generated from vehicles in parking lots runs off into streams and can have a negative impact on aquatic ecosystems. In areas with heavy rain, such as North Vancouver, municipalities are looking for diverse ways to infiltrate rain into the ground so it doesn't have to be managed by storm drains and pipe systems. Richard Bowes shows us a few examples in the district of North Vancouver. So what we're looking at is a, a method that we can use to create more or less a porous kind of parking lot surface. The, the blocks here fit together, but they leave probably about a half an inch gap between the blocks that allows rainwater to land on this surface and then soak into the ground underneath the surface. We get some benefit in terms of, you can see the little bits of pollution and oil that fall off the cars. That material, when it rains, gets uh, carried in between the cracks, moves into the soil where there's some natural aerobic decomposition that takes place and we actually help reduce some of that pollution. So we're here now at Harborview Park in North Vancouver, again at the mouth of Lynn Creek. And we're looking at another parking lot. This one is only a couple years old and it's using a very different approach in terms of managing the rain. The parking lot that you can see behind me uses traditional asphalt and the parking lot is sloped so that all the runoff runs into this what's called a bioswale in behind me. This parking lot has the benefit of biological controls in the vegetation in the swale no infrastructure or pipes needed underneath this parking lot to worry about replacing. So this is one of the newer, more modern approaches in which we're look, learning to manage parking lots. Here we can see a bioswale being built next to the parking lot of a new business complex in North Vancouver. It was designed to mimic a North Shore stream. The round river rock in the bottom resembles the stream bed where runoff can infiltrate. The soil along the edges will be planted with native grasses and vegetation. This is an example of an unvegetated swale that collects parking lot runoff. The gaps between the curb stops allow rainwater to run off into the swale. During really, really heavy rain, this ditch will actually fill up and allow water to pond in it to a certain degree, and then the manhole has an open grate, so we're protecting against flooding by when the water comes up to the lip of the manhole, it'll just exit out through the storm system. This parking lot in Crescent Beach was surfaced with pervious pavement. Pervious pavement can be engineered concrete or asphalt, where fine particles are left out to make it more porous, allowing rainwater to infiltrate right through. This eliminates the need for storm sewers. This site also includes a bioswale to receive any runoff that may occur during large rain events. Other parking lot designs incorporate vegetation right into the surface, as in these examples here. These work similarly to infiltrate and retain contaminants in the soil. Road designs. Traditional roads are often very wide. They have curbs and gutters, and they direct runoff into urban streams through a dense network of stormwater drains and pipes. These drains can clog with leaves, or even sediment traps in this case, and can lead to isolated pooling and flooding. 
Impervious surfaces can be reduced substantially by incorporating different road designs. When cul-de-sacs are designed into a hammerhead or T-shape as opposed to a large circular system, imperviousness can be reduced by up to 75%. New roads can integrate one of two similar design philosophies. The first is to keep curbs on roadsides, but provide gaps in the curb to direct water into swales in the middle or side of the road. Another variation of this can be found in Surrey, BC. On this street, road runoff enters the storm drain, but instead of being conveyed by a pipe, water is stored and infiltrated into a gravel trench. Through subsurface flow, this runoff enters an adjacent vegetated bioswale. Only during extreme rain events does this trench fill up, and overflow can exit through this pipe into the storm sewer. The second is to design roads with no curbs or gutters, so that road runoff is directed as overland flow into bioswales on the side of the road, where it then infiltrates. Swales operate most efficiently when they comprise a system of compartments that are filled with gravel and sand. Crown Street in Vancouver is a successful example of this design. Some of the swales are grassed, while others are planted and maintained as a part of homeowners' gardens. Some sections even drain into a wetland, indicated by the tall grass and rushes, while others have a storm drain for overflow. The road is purposefully curved to reduce traffic speed in this residential area. Detention Ponds and Wetlands Detention ponds can be situated throughout an urban watershed to temporarily receive and store piped stormwater runoff from adjacent neighborhoods. This storage process allows sediments and contaminants to settle to the bottom of the pond before the overflow water enters a water body. Carrie Barron takes us on a tour of a new detention facility still under construction in the city of Surrey. There's a lot of new development proposed on the hills just to the south of us, just behind us. And in order for that development to go ahead and not affect Highland Creek, Archibald Creek, it's a detention pond to manage the water. Developers um, are required to build the facilities before they can do their developments. One issue with detention ponds is that regular maintenance is required for them to function. They must be dredged and contaminated sediments need to be properly disposed. If we ever need to clean the inlet, because that's where the sediments will come out, we have a platform we can do it from here. We design these things now not for like your five-year storm, we design it for your frequent annual storms. The frequent storms are what causes the erosion, and that's really what you're doing a lot of this for. Ponds should be designed for easy maintenance, such as this one in the Wally neighborhood of Surrey. We're in uh, Surrey city centre. Upstream of this location is 100% is developed as far as parking lots and sort of low density commercial. The environmental review of the water coming out of Quibble Creek was that surprisingly it was in really good condition. There was really good quality of water. So what we're doing is just emphasizing that water quality. As time goes by and the water quality improves coming from upstream, we have very little maintenance at all. That bay in there is a sediment trap. So we can actually come in, excavate down to the, the lock blocks that are at the bottom without affecting too much of the habitat. Wetlands are even more effective designs because they not only store and absorb large quantities of runoff, but they are effective purification systems. Carrie shows us a wetland that was constructed as part of a park retrofit project. We're in a park that we um, did a revitalization project in about three years ago, four years ago where we integrated stormwater management into an older neighborhood into a, and then revitalized the park from a, taking an older park and making it more current and usable for residents in the neighborhood. We have a drainage utility in Surrey, so we have drainage money to build where we need drainage features. So we took the money from the drainage utility and we were able, because we didn't have to buy land to put the stormwater management facility, revitalize, use that money to revitalize the park. So it's like a double win for the city. Behind us is um, part of the stream and pond we built. Uh, what, what we tried to do here is have a lot of um, bench marshlands. There's a big bench marshland over here on our, on our left. Um, open waters, make sure it had pools, um, hiding places for fish. 
um, and lots of water quality treatment opportunities. Wetland vegetation can take up excess nutrients and metals and lock away contaminants into unavailable forms. This phytoremediation process better protects fish and other organisms in downstream habitats. A proper design for wetlands includes a forebay that serves as a deposition area for sediments, which can be removed on a regular basis. This assures that clogging of wetlands is minimized nutrient and dissolved metal uptake is maximized, and some degradation of hydrocarbons and pathogen reduction can take place within the wetland. Regular harvesting and replanting of new wetland vegetation is required to maintain efficiency. Wetlands can also be an attractive addition to residential neighborhoods, as in this example in the Chantrelle neighborhood of Surrey. Runoff from the street moves through the serpentine wetland system and local residents maintain the gardens. Mosquito outbreaks are of particular concern for urban wetlands. Standing water habitats are ideal mosquito breeding grounds. To protect local populations from the nuisance and potential exposure to serious diseases such as the West Nile virus, certain design measures must be taken. We can decrease mosquito problems by minimizing stagnant water bodies by installing an aerator or fountain in the wetland, minimizing eutrophication and resulting algal blooms as the algae provide food for and protect mosquito larvae, planting water lilies to cover the water surface, thus preventing larvae from connecting their breathing siphons to the air above, with proper permits, introducing predators that eat mosquito larvae and can survive semi-contaminated conditions, such as sticklebacks. And as a final resort, adding a biological control agent, such as a bacterial larvicide, to the wetland. Innovative stormwater management designs, or low-impact development, at the neighborhood scale, can delay and reduce surface runoff dramatically. They can also reduce contaminants, which under traditional designs are conveyed directly into streams. These low-impact development examples are still not mainstream in many municipalities, as the initial capital costs are often higher than conventional stormwater systems. So the more green infrastructure we can put in place now, we actually strongly believe we're going to save a lot of money in terms of future costs in dealing with some of these issues, erosion, flooding, and other kinds of things like that. Urban streams are the ultimate recipients of all the excess runoff and contamination. To protect urban streams from the cumulative effects from property and neighborhood activities requires additional innovations at the watershed scale, which is the subject of our third and final video segment. Stop till the sun has set on this mountain, sheds all the flesh from the bone.